Welcome, Jane and Jimmy. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. Just to start with, would you like to introduce yourselves and, and tell us a little bit about your background? Well, my name's Jimmy Edmonds. Um, um, I am a retired uh, documentary film editor. I've worked for 25 years for British broadcasters making a number of different documentaries. Um, um, I was brought up in the southeast of England, went to public school. I spent 32 years living in London, doing various jobs before I went to college to um, study photography, which is where I met my good partner, Jane, here, and who was in doing, who was, she was studying film at the same college, and I ended up, as a result, making a film with her and then descending into the TV industry. Um, so we've been married now for well over 25 years, and, um, and uh, we've got three children. Um, our, my son is part of our family, obviously. He's from a previous marriage. He's Joe. He's now 42. Um, and then we have Joshua, who would be 32, 33 at the moment, um, and Rosa, who's now 28. Um, our son Joshua died in a road accident in Vietnam in um, 2011. So that's a good decade ago now. Um, um, and um, as a result, really, of the Place, place that we found ourselves in after Joshua's death, um, we started up a charity called the Good Grief Project. Right. Well, I, you know, right at the very beginning, and you know, we've spoken before about this, but uh, um, I think we just have to acknowledge the sorrow and the sadness of losing Joshua. And uh, I think everyone who's listening, their hearts will go out to you. But we're going to talk a lot more about that um, because uh, that was also the birth of all kinds of other things. So, Jane, do you want to tell us about yourself? Yeah, so I was born in Scotland. I'm a middle child. Um, my father was a, an unsuccessful inventor um, and had a passion for creating things um, that were pretty impractical but that in many ways at the end of his life, he found purpose um, with an invention that won an award, which was the Logie Baird Inventors Award. So it's never too late. That taught me it's never too late. But my mother suffered from terrible depression. Um, so I grew up um, a little bit feral, running around outside, um, you know, sort of pushed out the door in the morning, come back in the evening. And I, I learned to be um, a sort of, carefree on the surface purpose person but underneath I was always worried about my mother's health and maybe that's what took me later on to become a psychotherapist um, I went into therapy myself I learned an awful lot and I realized that I had a passion for listening to people and observing people and learning from people which also led me in the direction of film school where I met Jimmy and Jimmy is one of the key kind of the key kind of person in my life in terms of what's happened since and what, what's still to happen. You know, we've learned so much together because we have three children. One is my stepson, Joe. He was three when I met Jimmy. Our son, Josh, who we, he was my first child. Um, and Josh was in our lives for 22 years and I kind of thought he'd be in our lives forever. <laughs> Um, so when he died, that was a huge shock. Um, we had another child called Rosa, who's five years younger. Um, and they had a really feisty relationship, really loved each other, but they were siblings, so they'd known each other forever. So when Josh died, um, we were kind of, as a family, thrown into, onto a different planet. My therapy training helped, but really in many ways that 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 only manifested itself later on because in the shock and the trauma of 
losing your child, we as a family kind of landed in a different place. We, you know, all the things that we'd imagined lay ahead were changed. Um, and though we'd done a lot of traveling, myself and Jimmy, and we'd had all sorts of interesting experiences, somehow Josh's death, there's life before and there's life after. Um, but to go back to my childhood, a really important part of my early years was that I didn't know I was Jewish um, until I was a teenager. I kind of knew something was slightly different, and certainly everyone else around me knew there was something different, because at school they would say to me, you're a bit dark, you're not Scottish. Um, and I don't, know, I don't think I can almost say what they said to me, because it's so awful, but my response was it was a it was a really racist comment are you a paki or a yid and my response to that was i'm scottish and i'd always blush bright red because deep down i obviously knew there was something because i'd heard my grandparents arguing in yiddish my parents denied their jewishness i think because they'd lived through and experienced so much anti-semitism in their lives they wanted to protect us and they thought that the best way to protect us was to collude and be silent and go into denial. So this is a big part of who I am now. I don't like denial. It's another reason I'm a therapist. I like to try and be authentic when I can, but I'm the same as everyone else. I get frightened at times. It's very difficult to be daring around difficult subjects. But it's certainly... A main pillar of my early life, you know, that sort of confusion about my identity, where I came from, what it meant to be Jewish, what it meant to be part of a group that was not liked, to be a tiny minority in a school where there was two Jewish girls, myself and one other. Um, and it, it became evident to me very early on, I needed to keep my head down because she was treated very badly. And so I colluded with my parents and I pretended that I wasn't who I was. Um, so scrolling right forward, when Josh died, it was interesting to me, both as a therapist and as a filmmaker and as an individual, someone who's worked with Jimmy on all sorts of projects, to realise that the trauma threw me back into all that. It opened up so many levels of confusion again, because that's what trauma does. Um, and so I sort of began to think about that again in terms of identity and grief and loss, loss of knowledge about who you are, a loss of knowledge as to who I was as a mother. I'd lost my child. I hadn't protected him. Even though so there's, there's I could have done. Yeah, one of the, I mean, one of the, uh, the, the many themes, uh, uh, the themes that we visited on the podcast and, and racism, racism is a strong theme and, and the confusion that racism brings, you know, you come from a normal family and yet you look a bit different and then you suffer all kinds of things. And and trauma is also something that we that we're increasingly visiting. So um, they're all things which are kind of ongoing themes, which which uh, I love to discuss because I think the more we know about them, the better. But what was you know the, there's a kind of before Joshua died and after Joshua died. What was life like before Joshua died? Can you give us a sense of you know where were you? Life was just going along normally, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, I mean, what I would say about that, Jimmy might say something different, but I think when Josh died, you know, he'd reached that point in his life where we'd given him the roots we felt he needed and we'd let him fly. And in a way, I kind of felt as a mother, I've done my job, this is the best bit, you know, he's going to be fine. And I kind of, I don't know why, I, I mean, because we all worry about something terrible happening, but it just never occurred to me that it would. You know, as a child, I'd worried about him. Um, but as a 22-year-old, I thought, he's safe, he's good, he's happy. And so when he died so suddenly in a road accident, which it really was a sudden accident, you know, he, he swerved to avoid a man on a bike and was hit by a lorry and was killed instantly. We didn't get to say goodbye to him. Um, and it kind of threw our world into a state of abject, gut-wrenching agony. Um, because as a family, we were very close. And I think it was very hard to make sense of it. So in a way, what happens, I think, at that point is your belief in the world, your belief in everything you've held dear is destroyed. So 
I suppose I felt safer in the world. I'd worked at feeling safe in the world. I'd found my balance. It was good enough. It was fine. And then when Josh died, I was thrown straight back into the early primitive place that lots of people find themselves in following a trauma. And so so how did you get to hear about Joshua dying? Do you want to relate the story of all of that? Yes. I mean, do you want to do that, Jimmy, or would you rather I did? Um. Jane had gone out, it was Sunday morning, and Jane had gone out for a run. Um, and um, around about 11 o'clock, um, uh, as I was making breakfast, she came back from the run. Um, Rosa was upstairs, still asleep, part of the normal family life, I guess, of a teenager who, even at 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning, is going to be fast asleep. Um, um, luckily, Jane had come back from her run because just a few minutes later, we saw a police car um, passing past the, the front of the house. It's a small lane uh, where, where we were living, um, and um, it was clear that they didn't quite know where they were going. Um, so... It backed up, it stopped, uh, two police officers got out and we automatically thought that they were in themselves lost and were looking for directions to find another address. But as it happened, as soon as we let them into the door, um, we could see that um, there was bad news afoot and uh, they, uh, they told us almost immediately, are we... Um, you know, the parents of Josh Edmonds, because they've had message via the consulate in Vietnam that he'd been killed in a road accident. Um, so um, that's, I can tell that, 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 that story because it's obviously still very, very vivid, vivid um, in, in my mind. Um, um, and I don't suppose I will ever, ever forget it because I guess it's one of the sort of, you know, it's one of the most, it's one of the strongest images of, of my whole life, really. And it, it's obviously staying in my, in my head until I die. Um, These things get imprinted. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and uh, I, you know, uh, I, I, I don't know if you want to talk about the grief. Uh, I mean, we... I think those of us who haven't lost a child can only imagine it and not want to imagine it. And uh, it's your kind of, uh, if I think about that, it's your kind of worst nightmare. Um, really? But I think we should touch on that. Well, I, I could say something about that. Jimmy, were you about to say something? Yeah. No. I, I think you, your words are chosen well, Julian, because what we represented was other parents' worst nightmare. And I think that at a deep and unconscious level, that's difficult for other people. It's not nearly as difficult as it was for us, obviously, being in that situation and living it. But being bereaved can be very lonely and being bereaved can be very isolating. And, of course, when you're thrown into that landscape, you really don't know what to do. You feel so exposed emotionally it's like you're, you're jangling your nerves are frayed everything's on edge and it's like in the blink of an eye your your whole life is changed forever and you and at that point you don't have hope for the future you know you've got if you're lucky enough to have other children and my heart goes out to anyone who doesn't have other children but if you're lucky enough to have other children <clears throat> it kind of Reminds you, you know, Rosa's sitting on the step. She's just woken up. She's just heard this news about her brother. She's saying, what's happening? What's happening? Jimmy and me are in a state of shock. You have to kind of, certainly me as a mother, I had to kind of pull myself into some state of reasonable awareness. I was also, oddly, very aware of the young police, man and woman, who were not, not qualified or able to break this news they would obviously had no training and I was concerned for them but furious with them for not being more skilled and I found myself shouting at them tell me he didn't suffer even though my head was saying they don't know that I want them to lie to me so 
people who are delivering bad news need really great support. They didn't have it and they couldn't hold what was happening in front of them. Jimmy had fallen to the floor and was sort of collapsed. I thought he was having a heart attack. It was like a living nightmare. And so that was the beginning of our grief journey. And it's not that we hadn't experienced grief before, because, you know, there's all sorts of grief in life, but... Nothing like that. Nothing like that. No, and, no, you know, no, I'm a therapist. No, I've nothing, worked with no. I've worked with grieving people in my practice over the years, you know, and I'm a good enough therapist, and I've always been able to sit with discomfort silently. But I know now I wasn't as good as I could have been. Because in the 11 years that since Josh has died, I've learned how to be able to be alongside people in a much better way. Part of training to be a therapist is that you have to be able to tolerate the discomfort in the room. So I could. However... Well, just tolerate your own discomfort. Tolerate my own discomfort. But tolerate the discomfort of what people... You know, if people tell me something that's uncomfortable, yeah, I have to sit... And, and, and so as the years passed, you know, I got better and better at sitting with difficult stuff. Um, I, I experience grief as a sort of parallel world. Um, you know, there's, there's me over there that is the guy who was the dad to Joshua who is now dead. And then there's the sort of me here that is also that, but somebody who's talking about that person who's over there. And... Um, it, it, it's there's a sort of disconnect, if you like. Even ten years down the line, there's a disconnect with the fact, or I say disconnect, but a sort of vague disbelief that this has actually happened to us. And, and, and instead, even to, you know, at the beginning, of course, that is, you know, the trauma is so great that you totally dissociate from it. Or mm, I, these mm. ways up that, that I did, the physical aspect of it was one of a total bodily collapse. But the mental aspect of it was that, that you know, that this didn't really happen. This is still just a dream, and sooner or later, you know, it'll all right itself. Um, um, and, of course, it doesn't. And so trying to accommodate the, the unreal with the real um, is, I guess, the process that we've been trying to do, or I've been trying to do, over the last 10 years. I think that and uh, uh, that, that kind of experience of uh, a, a separation, I think, is uh, uh, really common in trauma mm. and it works really well as a way of kind of protecting you from the worst ravages of it. And that integration, I mean... That's the whole journey, isn't it? Is that? I absolutely agree yeah. with that. And thankfully, we do have psychological makeups that have these safety valves involved there that you don't then, you know, because the alternative is to go completely fucking mad. You know, yeah. you'll just lose the plot altogether and probably run off the nearest bridge. Um, if you, but I found that that was, it was still very necessary, like Jane was saying, is it's still somehow, oh, you've got to try. And to to make it real in some form or whatever, um, we were saying that I I'd, I'd not experienced anything like this before, um, and I hope you know, and I really do hope, all right, because that still that becomes quite a fear that one of our other children suffers, you know, some horrible fate, um, or even one of the grandchildren now, you know, God forbid that you know that 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 this this shit should happen again, but. I had, right, suffered bereavements of uh, before. I was at the same age that Josh was when he died. I was also in a car accident in which my girlfriend at the time died. Um, and given, and then scroll forward yet another um, about 10 years, my best friend died in, the, in a terrible plane crash in Madrid. Two very, very close people to me had died. And yet, I don't think that I ever properly grieved for them properly because I didn't have the wherewithal or the social fabric around me to understand what I needed to do in order to try mm. and accommodate what had happened. So I cut off from them. 
I cut I I I cut off from them in a way which you know has never been particularly comfortable for me. So that um, and as a result, I've lost the impact of their lives on my life. I've lost. I, I mean, I I think that the it, you know this business about cutting off and um, doing what you can. I think we have to respect that mm -hmm. as a that's how you managed, you know, and the, the whole integration process. Oh my God, you need so much maturity for that and time and healing and yeah. goodness knows what, you know. So I, I don't think, I guess what I'm saying is, you know, I can see that that's an effective way of dealing with it. And I'm sure you're not hard on yourself about it because I'm sure you understand it. But I wouldn't want uh, like the listeners to be thinking, oh my God, I'm doing the wrong thing. If that's where you are, cause, because that's how you're, that's how you're keeping things together. I would you know? say that, you know, the integration can sometimes come later and sometimes yeah. your back has to be against the wall before you can move forward. And I've been to that place where I've had nowhere else to go. And I would say to anyone who's listening and who's, who's worried about, you know, their, their way of grieving, everyone does it differently and there's no right or wrong. But I think what I would say is at the end of the day, grief will out. And yeah. that in many ways, it's probably best to find some way of expressing it, which has been, I suppose, the baseline of our work, films, projects, presentations, because we didn't know when Josh died how to fold him into our hearts and to carry him with us in a more comfortable way where the edges weren't stabbing you in the heart. Whereas now I might see someone who reminds me of him and I might a tear might come to my eye and I'll think, oh, Josh, I miss you. And I'll carry on. And I carry on and I'm hopeful. And in a way, I miss him every day. And you don't get over grief ever. And closure for me is the dirty word. It's about openings. Yeah. You know, in a way, the discovery is what you think may not be possible in the early stages of grief can be possible. But I'm not saying it isn't without huge amounts of work. And, and that work has to be done in the right time for you not for anyone else. And I think that a lot of people put a lot of pressure on the bereaved to get back to where they were and be their old selves, but there's no such thing. I will yeah. never be my old self and neither will Jimmy. I know, but, I mean, and it's obviously common parlance is that no one person grieves. We all grieve differently, everybody. We, 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 we know all of this. But the, and the reason why that is the case, the reason, for instance, why I grieve differently from you is because of who I am before. Exactly. that happened and so if i am the sort of person that has been molded for instance by a sort of western idea of 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 masculinity say for instance mm. right and i've been molded by that and that's really part of my makeup it's inevitable that i'm going to in that sense you know try and shoulder the pain and the and the, and 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 all, and, and all of that without you know, exposing too much vulnerability. I'm, I'm going to, you know, I'm just going to, mm. you know, try and, and and stand up to it and all of that. And um, and and I think that you know you could be doing it differently because of your own, own, own yeah. background. And because you know, at the same time, of course, those there are social, I don't know, colours that 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 sort of, you know. It's, you know, help to make us who we are anyway, and we can explore some of those common, I these common sort of um, aspects of, of 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 what what makes the difference between the way in which a dad would yes. grieve and the way in which a, a mother would grieve. Absolutely, but I think that difference, of course, is at the heart of how relationships stay together after someone dies. Because if you can't acknowledge, or break apart. Well, I was going to say, if you can't acknowledge the difference, it's quite likely you will break apart. So we've had to face our differences and recognise we do this differently, and it's brought us together. On the other hand, we know that it can tear people apart, but we're not saying, um, you know, that, that that's inevitable. It's really not. It's like every relationship, you know, trauma brings out the best and the worst in people. Um, and if things were 
vulnerable before, they're going to be more vulnerable after. If they were strong enough, they will endure. But I think the pressure, Julian, the external pressure on the bereaved is quite a big thing. And, you know, to to revert back to who you were, as, as I said earlier, you know, it's like you, you're back to your old self again. Your eyes are shiny. You look bright. Yeah. Well, actually, that's not how I feel. And that puts a lot of pressure on people who are grieving to play the game. Yeah. Um, and we very quickly learned that, I very quickly learned that there was something about choosing who I spoke to and finding peer-to-peer -peer support that absolutely saved my bacon. I like okay. bacon. <laughs> so, so this that was my that's my yeah. Is that a, yeah? No, not your bacon, but your <laughs> sanity, maybe. <laughs> I, I can say that because I, I I come from a Jewish background as well. I so I appreciate yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I uh, right. <laughs> so, um, um, so I, I, that was the kind of next area that I wanted to explore because um, because I think that you know when with sitting with a professional hat, you know the professional people involved in looking after health health and social care professionals looking after people who are going through bereavement have a kind of a. Uh, uh, and either or, either is you're fine or you need some kind of specialist support. And 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 there's not a sense uh, always of that the support comes uh, from the people around you. Um, and, um, uh, and, uh, and that and everyone needs that. Uh, you know, that the, the people we know and love are absolutely critical for everyone. So who were the people that you reached out to in because I am you know like we you know grief is a recurring theme on the podcast and 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 one of the recurring themes of that is that some of the friends you thought you could reach out to you can't and others who you had no idea about become your closest friends. So what was your experience of that? So well so, you know I think there's a great term for it. I mean secondary grief took over for me because my address book changed and the people I thought would be there for me really well-intentioned lovely lovely people couldn't hack who I was in that moment and I had to go through who I was in that moment to become who I am now and so people understandably drifted away from me at the time I was just heartbroken by that I mean that really was it wasn't in, it's not it's not till after the funeral that this sort of thing happens because before the funeral everyone is magnificent after the funeral's over people go back to their lives why wouldn't they but of course our lives were changed and we yeah. you know yeah and it's still broken yeah and so i think the worst time for me was around the end of the first year beginning of the, the second year was the worst for me because the reality was kicking in and I realized my address book had changed and the people that I'd loved and lent on were gone because I, I wasn't moving quick enough. I was working by this time and I was loving my work and the structure um, was great and I was working probably better than I've ever worked before but in my private and personal life I wasn't doing so well so I had supervision in place, I had therapy in place, it was okay but my friendship group didn't like it because I was different. So that's when I, I thought to myself, I've got to find people who lived this experience that I'm living so that I feel normal again. And that was a turning point for me. It was a lot easier for me to talk about Josh with people who didn't know him in the first place. And so it, it struck me that in my relationships with um, close friends in the village, there was a degree of embarrassment that sort of settled on any conversation when Josh came into the room. Um, and, and that's something that I felt um, very awkward about, that maybe I shouldn't bring him in. Um, and there were moments when I remember that it was, it was unavoidable. I just couldn't deal with a social situation going around to somebody's dinner party 
I remember one in particular when, when you know, there must have been about 20 or 30 people there, a small gathering, if you like, lots of drinks going, the music was going. I just couldn't hack it. I just really, really couldn't hack it. All of these people on the surface would be totally supportive and they would be, um, you know, um, extremely loving and friendly. Um, but it, I did find it very difficult turning around to the host and saying, listen, I just can't hack this, I've got to go home. And that happened on a number of occasions, um, like, for instance, at Esther's wedding, you know, and this is another, you know, maybe, what, six or seven years down the line. And again, a situation whereby everybody's having a really, really good time. I wanted to have a good time too. But there was, I just, physically, I just, I just couldn't get into it. Neither could I actually be there in that, in, in, you know, in that, in that presence. I couldn't sort of do what I've often done in the past, which is quite nice, actually, just sit in the corner of the room and, and just feel the vibe as it's going <laughs> around you. You know, I quite like doing that. Nobody's taken any notice of me. <laughs> But I'm just enjoying the vibe, the music and the conversation. You sort of kind of buzz out to that. I couldn't even do that. I just felt too too wretched. And I didn't want people to see my wretchedness either. Um, but in all and, fairness, I mean, you know, I think the problem is that but, when people are talking about their children in a group and they bring up their kids who yeah, might be at university yeah. or doing something and you say, oh, Josh might have gone to university. And then a deadly hush comes over the room and you think, I shouldn't have said that. There's no room for the dead in this room. But what's, yeah, yeah. But what's also interesting is that, you know, so as you said, you're a desperate, desperate to changes. I'm not in contact with any of the guys who were in my social group, um, you know, at the time when Josh died. So, what so, if the they were then? I'm not in contact with them now in any way. We have just grown apart. So, as, as we both know, um, you know, the experiences that you describe are ones that are lived by so many people. And I think there are two things that I, I think are worth drawing out. Um, well, there are many things worth drawing out, but there's two that I want to draw out. Um, one is um, that talking to people who didn't know Josh is and especially people who uh, have been through grief themselves makes an enormous difference. In other words, like talking to family and friends who know who knew Josh can be really, really tricky because they feel uncomfortable about talking about it. I'm talking about our friends. I'm not talking about Josh's friends. Yeah. Josh's friends, it's really easy. To talk, yeah. To them. We've actually just had a couple of his old friends come by to see us today, this morning. And although we don't, um, you know, talk specifically about, you know, um, um, about his death, you know, the fact that Josh had broken his arm comes up in conversation because we're talking about, you know, his mate's a doctor in A and E, and we were talking about the various things that he has to see in A and E, and just the fact that Josh had broken his arm when he was eleven came into the conversation. It's seriously easy to talk with with them about them. Yeah, no yeah. embarrassment whatsoever. They can come yeah. in and out of the conversation as and when he likes. If that conversation had happened with any of the friends that I was talking about, the adult friends who are now, that would have been the party stopper. That would have been a conversation stopper. Yeah. So, and and I think it's a really important point because it's it's saying that that role of reaching out to people who didn't know the person that you lost yeah is a really important feature of how we reach out for support i think that's the point i'm really trying to get at mm -hmm. yes um, yeah. i i i yeah I, I get that and i think that part of the problem is the fact is that the people who knew josh and who knew us before he died i guess expected us to be the same sort of people yeah and that after he died it just you know we couldn't fulfill that role for them any longer um and but new people new friends they don't have an expectation yeah. of how you're going to be and so yeah you can you can um you can mention you know, say, how many children have you got 
you have to be you have to be sensitive about how you answer that question. Yeah. Um, and um, but if you if you do it quietly and gently, then there's real empathy from them, and there's no expectation to know who you were before that before yeah. that had happened, and therefore you can sort of meet them on more neutral ground if you like. It's about learning strategies that give you the courage to say calmly and with confidence, I've got three kids and one of whom is dead. Yeah. Now, I know an awful lot of people who will never be able to say that, and I know a lot of people who've learned to say it, and I know a lot of people who want to say it, but it's about the people outside of our lives. I think, I don't know, I mean, we're quite different in this way, but I really, I really like opening these conversations because I believe if we can model a mirror, a comfort, a comfortable enough way of communicating around the most nightmarish scenarios, it gives people permission to get alongside you. And that helps create community and comfort and support. And it normalizes this sort of feeling that you have that you're 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 sort of alone. You know, you're not alone anymore. You're alongside other people. Yeah. So the other the other aspect of that is yeah, I'm sure that, you know, all your friends from the past would like to think that they're good people and would be horrified on the reflection. So there's a bit of uh, advice that you could give to people who who haven't experienced that level of grief themselves. What's the best way of supporting people that you love who are going through it? Well, my answer to that is that the best and bravest thing that you can do is deal with your own discomfort and don't ask questions that you don't want to hear the answer to. If you really want to know, then ask the question. But the most helpful thing for me is people who can tolerate their discomfort, their own discomfort. And can just be alongside you. So I'd say to anyone, if you want to help someone who's grieving, just, it's not about getting the right words. It's just about being comfortable enough in the room with that person to sit with them. Mm. You might not even say anything, Mm. but just being alongside. And Mm. you don't have to be clever and you don't, Mm. whatever you do, need to come up with, well, maybe they're in a better place or everything happens for a reason. Everyone does that because they're so embarrassed. We know that. But my advice is just, breathe Mm. and be with that Mm. person in the room Mm. however Mm. awful it feels and Mm. it does feel awful to sit next to a bereaved parent i know because before josh died i felt it differently to how i feel it now Mm. i can do it i can sit Mm. next to any bereaved person Mm. i can be silent i can Mm. be whatever Mm. is needed Mm. jimmy what do you think well it's absolutely obviously if you've if you've had the same experience it's very easy to be with somebody else who's lost who's you know whose son or daughter has died. Yes, yeah, it's, it's really easy. If you haven't been there before, it's, yeah, it's excruciating. It's really, really hard. Um, and because I guess, um, you know, we've not been sort of taught, it's not part of sort of, you know, our sort of cultural language to know how it is to be with grief in the, in, in the, in the room. It's not, it's not part of it, but the, you know, it is quite simple at the end of the day. Conquer your own fear and just be. Just you don't have to say anything. As a, as a, as a bereaved person myself, I, I know when, when somebody's uncomfortable and when somebody's not uncomfortable. It's just, you just know just by body language or whatever. You just know that. And therefore I'm going to gravitate to the person who is probably saying nothing that is comfortable rather than the person who's trying to, who is, you know, trying to explain stuff and is clearly uncomfortable. I think Jimmy's absolutely right, you know, and I think the thing is that for health professionals as well, it's really interesting because we often get asked to give talks to doctors or to health practitioners, health visitors, whatever, about getting over or being more comfortable with grief. And, you know, you can't help but be struck by the fact that it's not an important part of the training, how to get alongside people who are grieving. You know, obviously it's changing and it's improving, but it's like the two young police people. I mean, why put them in that situation? It's not kind to them. It, they must have been traumatised, deeply traumatised. Um, and they weren't equipped. We need to equip people to be able to be with this level of discomfort. So our talks and presentations, maybe it might be to the police or it might be to 
ambulance crews or health visitors is often about just this. What's helped us, what hasn't, trying to normalise the the nightmare that we represent, and we're really not that nightmarish in reality. No, it's <laughs> exactly that. You know, the nightmare that we represent, you know, it's built up into being something that is so awful, it's un, 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 it's, you can't handle it, and therefore you will go mad in some way or another. And actually, yeah, it, it, on one level, yes, it is a nightmare, but, but it's not. Listen, I'm, I'm still alive and I'm still breathing. I'm still standing up, right? I'm still the person I am. I am not some ghoul from a nightmare, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's just, you know, I'm, it's just, I'm just not that. And so. you have a lot of fun. And you still have a lot of fun. Exactly. I was going to which say. Which could bring us on to the, the weekends, which are a lot of fun. I was going to just say that because we run these grief retreats for bereaved parents, which are active and creative grief retreats with boxing, creative writing, photography. And if you were to hover above it, Julian, you would notice that there's so much laughter. And of course, there's tears, but you'd think it was a birthday party or a wedding. Because the laughter and the relief when people can take off their mask, the laughter and relief when people can take off their mask is enormous. And people just, they think, they, they arrive at our retreats very often and they say, oh, I can't do this, it's a terrible mistake, I shouldn't be here, this is too much. And they come in and they, I'll just stay for 10 minutes. And then by the end of the weekend, they leave, feeling such relief, such a sense of achievement that they've understood this idea around continuing bonds, maybe through creating a photograph. They, they all bring photographs and they make a new photograph. They take something new away with them from the retreat. It doesn't matter what it is, or even it's just surviving the weekend. It's a rather hopeful thing because grief like ours and like so many is something you don't think you'll survive. And it's like arriving at the retreat and saying, I shouldn't be here. I can't do it. It's like grief. We just did a, a, a a, a walk for the charity and um, the Three Peaks Challenge, Yorkshire. And I swore I couldn't do it. And it was agony. And I pretty much hated half of it. But I did it. Mm. And I can't believe I did it. And everyone mm. did it. We were aged between 17 mm. and 71. Everyone did it. We all, even the young ones, had moments of hating it because it was so challenging. But we were walking side by side. We didn't know each other. Side by side, we climbed these hills, we climbed downs, we suffered the aches in our knees and in our hearts and in our breathing. And the feeling that night of total satisfaction mixed with exhaustion and physical pain was fabulous because we'd done what we thought we couldn't do. And that's, and, and, that's the grief journey. And done it together as well. Done it together. Yeah. And so tell us about your your uh, bereavement retreats. How did they start and um, who goes on them and why did you start them? So th there, are, there are many things that have, that you've both been involved with since Joshua died. And, and I think for, you've kind of forged a path to make it easier for other people. So we're going to work our way through those different things. And um, let's start with your bereavement retreats. Well, it's nice of you to say that we've forged a path, but I think what we've done is just deviated from another path. <laughs> um, um, we'd, you know, we'd, we'd been working with the Compassionate Friends over a number of years. Um, we'd helped to make a promotional video for them, and we volunteered for a number of retreats that that they do um, um, retreats that are exclusively for bereaved parents and siblings and run exclusively by bereaved parents and siblings and so there's that that sort of peer-to-peer -peer network and sort of support we were talking about is the foundation of the work of the compassionate friends um, so we'd had some experience and we'd learnt a little bit about how to run retreats. But this was um, after Josh died, of course, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah. That's the point. Yeah. Um, um, and we'd learnt a little bit about it. We'd learnt something of the value of them as well. Um, but they were, in, 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 in our opinion, a little bit too... Um, um, all-encompassing I suppose you could say you'd go on one of these retreats and you'd have probably around about 10 different sessions that you could sign up to at any one time 
and they all became a little bit sort of um, uh, remote, a little bit sort of anonymous. Mm. Um, and so we thought that given that what we like to do is take photographs, make films, um, you know, and, you know, engage in sort of quite, you know, sort of, you know, some exercise, running, swimming, whatever it is, that um, that why don't we just concentrate those aspects of what it is that we like to do and um, produce our own retreats. And so, in a way, that's what that what came that we 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 set ourselves with the idea that we would provide three sessions: one, creative writing; the second one would be physical exercise, and the third one would be exploring your grief with 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 photography something that was actually missing from anything that the tcf the compassionate friends do um and and yeah and that's that's the way in which it sort of set out and we spent i guess about must have been about six months trying to organize it and recruiting people to come on it um it was quite nerve-wracking the first one that we did um but it was very very well attended um and we found that the fact that it is small we don't have more than 20 to 25 people coming on the retreats the fact that we are a family unit um that 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 is the core of um of, of of the weekend um it's grown a little bit since the the first ones and we do have other people coming on board now to 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 help so there's a team of eight for the next one will be a team of eight, of which four of us are the Harris Edmonds family. Um, uh, Joe, Josh's older brother, is a personal trainer, um, and he hadn't really been involved with the charity at all, or any of our filmmaking, or uh, or, or any of the presentations that that, that that we were doing. I felt a little bit left out; didn't know what to do. So the opportunity that arose that when we started talking about providing some form of um, sessions where people could, you know, exercise their grief. Um, he really jumped on it. Um, and he's, he's, he's basically the main uh, or, and the key, key person in, in that aspect of keeping grief active. Um, um, and then Rosa, uh, she came on board as the cook. And actually, right, what she provides um, is sort of really nice, home cooked, wholesome, and really sort of lovely food. And that's the other thing that we realized that was kind of a bit different from the previous retreats that we'd worked on is that when everybody sits around the same table eating a, a, a choice of really, really lovely food. Those moments are as important as anything else in terms of the way in which you then sit and share your story. You're sharing food and you're sharing your story. And then, you know, inevitably people, you know, they at the end of the meal they start to pack up, they'll help to wash up and things like that. So it all becomes, at that scale, we're talking about 20 to 25 people, at that scale it becomes quite intimate and you know, in a, in a, in 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 well, in my mind, a lot more fulfilling and a lot more rewarding than um, a, a, a slightly more sort of official and organised event. But what our participants would say is that something about the fact that this our retreats are run as a family, it doesn't have to be literally a family, but it is. But because it's run by siblings and parents who are all bereaved. Um, it models something hopeful about maintaining relationships and, you know, something about family systems staying connected. And I think that's really important because obviously when a child dies or a sibling dies, families are shattered. They're, they're ripped apart. And so to see us working together, I mean, it never ceases to amaze me that we manage to do this because we do manage to do it and it's comfortable. But I... I think the significance is that other people think, well, if they can do it, maybe we can try it. Maybe we don't need to protect our children from this grief. If we're strong enough maybe to tolerate sharing our feelings, maybe our children can too. Um, But it also, don't you say that it models a sort of mummy-daddy therapeutic sort of 
um, it's sort very of holding sort of yeah environment. Yeah. And so, however, the, either one of us is actually feeling about it. You know, we're there as as as, as yeah. As, as contained, what, yeah. As a sort of safe container. And I, I mean, think, even I guess that we are a mummy and a daddy to the group. Symbolically. Even if, symbolically, even if yeah, some of the people in the group will be older than us. It's a therapeutic alliance. It's a sort of containment of you something. Know more about that. I suppose, and as a therapist, I suppose I know the importance of that. But I think having our children freely and independently available to other people too and able to express themselves. It's really important. I think what Jimmy said about food is really important. Food is not just food. Food is, is a representation of Secrets. taking care of others mm. and not taking shortcuts. And I mean, after mm. the first meal that Rosa produced, everyone started yeah. clapping. Yeah, it's, it's like <laughs> she produced this, she produced this, yeah, the drama of her dinner had <laughs> resulted in this huge round of applause to the extent there was an encore, encore. She had to go and make something else. <laughs> I think that the I, I I guess is one of the ways I think about this is um, that that food in the context of human history and and in the way that we've evolved and how we evolved has always been really important mm. and sitting around <clears throat> sharing food it is a way of sharing custom and habit. It's a way of sharing ancestral tales mm. that get passed down from one generation to the next. Mm. And it's absolutely a way of sharing love, laughter and friendship. Mm. And symbolically, it's a really, really powerful time. Mm. And and it sounds like, um, so I, I guess in my mind, and I, uh, there's a sense, uh, you can see how, whether this is accurate or not, but there's a sense of um, that what you're describing is that while it uh, has got a therapeutic component to it, it's the, it sounds like it's the healing power of love, laughter and friendship that happens not because of a professional relationship, no. but because of the kindness and compassion of human beings supporting each other. One with another, absolutely, yeah. Absolutely, Julian, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Creating a ritual on. as well is, of course, at the at the heart of this. So to, to create a ritual, I mean, I can't help but go back to the fact that Josh died while travelling and we didn't get to say goodbye. So right from the moment he died, we, had, we started creating rituals in a way. Um, the funeral, you know, the celebration of his life. And everything after that has been about what you've just said, you know, creating a kind of community around him that holds the memories um, and the love and the laughter. Um, and, and that, that feels but, good, actually. But, I mean, but thank you for pointing out the sort of non-professional aspect mm. of it um, because it's, it's something I, I think that, we, that has grown more or less intuitively um, but I would hate it to be anything else. And we do try and point out, although you're a little bit reticent about the fact that, you know, we don't claim to be, you know, professionals. I'm not oh, a no, professional I'm not. photographer. I'm not a professional, you know. So we, we, it's not as if we can give you expert advice as to what to do or what not to do. But it really is something that does engender that, that sort of common empathy one with another. I don't know what being an expert means. I mean, you're an expert photographer. I'm an expert therapist. Whatever that means, it doesn't mean a thing. Because yeah, when, you're not... with, when you're with peer-to-peer -peer or people who are experiencing raw emotion, it doesn't matter it's how about good sharing, you are at your it's job. About it's about sharing about... experience and learning from that sharing. It's about being authentic and open in the face of discomfort, yeah. really. And, you know, you could be the best professional in the world and the worst person for offering empathy and compassion. <laughs> I think that there's a, so there's a, uh, I now have to put on, you know, my kind of compassionate communities hat yeah. and, um, it, which is a kind of intersection point for us in a way. And, um, and I think medicine and the healthcare professions in, on, in, across the board have kind of lost their way to some degree. Uh, because of the evolutionary perspective, when you start drilling down as to what's happening, what, how did we evolve, and then what happens at a 
a genomic level, what happens at a biochemical level, how the how our brain evolved, how our brain functions, and uh, everywhere we look, what we see is that this aspect of of the kindness and compassion that we carry with us has a very direct impact on our physical and mental health. In fact, even separating them is is uh, uh, incorrect. Uh, is 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 a, a complete misunderstanding of of what goes on with human biology, and in particular, there's an aspect of it um, in which um, the the impact of that stuff is so powerful that it is more powerful than all the medicines we take. It's more powerful at, than giving up smoking, drinking, diet and exercise and anything else you care to mention on human health. And what you're, I, I, I would uh, interpret to a degree what you're saying um, in that the, the things that you're doing is that you're connecting with other people who, who have similar experiences to yourself and have a powerful impact on those people, which is more than just a mental thing of dealing with grief. It's deep inside us as human beings about who we are. And the standing alongside is part of human evolution. It's actually part of animal evolution. In fact, you can even, like, so I'm on a soapbox now and I'm off and I apologize for this, but, but are you, like we, we evolve, uh, we don't evolve as individuals, we evolve as ecosystems. We evolve in relation to everything else because it just wouldn't work any other way. And that, that mutual support, that mutual independence is, a, is the absolute key feature of ecosystems. Of of evolution of ecosystems because if it's not working in harmony, it just dies. And and what you're in a way to me what you're saying is an absolute full recognition. Uh, when you say peer to peer, what you're saying is it's community, it's it's love, laughter, and friendship, it's compassion and kindness, which has an absolutely profound effect. And, and, and it's something that everyone needs. Not everyone needs professional support, but everyone needs this other stuff. And, and, uh, and a lot of the, so, I mean, you know, that's probably quite a good way of introducing the other things that you've been doing because filmmaking has been a, uh, an important part of your journey. So tell us about your filmmaking journey. Yeah, well, it started pretty soon after... Josh died. I mean, we've done so many different projects, really. It was our way of doing something when we didn't know what else to do, because it's what we do. So Jimmy mentioned um, a film we made for the Compassionate Friends. We called it Say Their Name. It was the first film we made after. Well, actually, the first film we made was called Beyond Goodbye. I'm sorry, that was actually about Josh's funeral. And that was about listening to and sharing stories with all the friends of Josh and family um, and trying to create something that we could um, carry forward with us. But it's also so, about recording something that we could then look back on. Yes, that's very as true. As well. Very true. Um, very you true. Know, because, um, yeah, it was, in, it was important. In a way in which people take photographs of any event, people, you know, mm. they, they, you do it. You take a picture of the child when it's first born. You take a picture of the first day of school. You take a picture of blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, we would then, re we, we would need to record all, you know, or have some kind of sort of recording of all of the people that turned up for Josh's funeral because we felt honoured by their presence. And um, it was, it, we just felt like we didn't want that to be, well, I didn't want it to be, you know, lost into, into the sort of, you know, fog mm. of so many memories. And it was like, you know, you know, it, it, so much was happening. And, um, you know, and obviously with, with our own brains in relative turmoil, what were we going to remember and what would mm. we not, what would we be forgetting? You know, surely what we need to do is to make sure that, um, you know, that um, what we were doing for Josh and his funeral um, was, you know, that in and of itself was 
remembered in some way or another. Well, that was very much creating the rituals. That was the first thing beyond goodbye. And then we made Say Their Name for the Compassionate Friends, which we called it Say Their Name because that was the thing that we found most difficult, that nobody would say Josh's name. People would complain endlessly. Why don't people just say the name of my child who's no longer here? Um, but that was learned experience as well. That was very from the, much from the experience. From the testimonies of the um, people parents. within it. So we interviewed about 10 different people over a weekend um, for that. Um, and uh, there was one particularly strong interview um, where, you know, she basically challenged other people not to be afraid, not to not say their name. Say their name out yeah, loud. To say their name out loud. And that became obvious that that was going to become the title for, the, for that particular film. And then, of course, our feature film, Love That Never Dies, that was actually um, Winston Churchill Fellowship supported us with that and it was a road trip driving from one side of America to the other from New York to San Francisco interviewing bereaved parents along the way and it was a road trip it was a homage to Josh and it was hard and it was enlightening but it was looking back on it now I mean it's a feature documentary and it's been seen far and wide and is available on Amazon and Vimeo and people watch it for all sorts of different reasons but we made it because it was helping us to, A, you know, kind of realise this homage to Josh. We wanted to go on a road trip when he died. We didn't have the wish or the wherewithal. The last holiday together we'd had was in America as a family. Um, and so we gathered these stories and made this feature documentary, Love That Never Dies, and the clues in the title of the film. You know, it's like this idea that you'll get over your grief and you'll let them go. And, of course, what we were fast realising is you don't let them go in it's a love that, you know, when your child goes off to university, you don't stop loving them, do you? you? You kind of miss them desperately more and more until they come home or until. But it was, I mean, effectively, it was an expanded version of Say Their Name. Mm. And Say Their Name is something in which we, you know, and you did the interviewing. I was sort of camera and editing. behind the camera or something. I can't remember where I was. Somebody else was recording it. But um, the, the point was that what we'd learned was that by by talking to people on camera, um, we got a, a different evaluation effectively of what each person's grief was like. And the, and the reasons for doing that was because it was validating our own feelings, what, what, what we, yeah. were, we were doing through. And so there was an exchange going on there between filmmakers and subjects, which, you know, helped to, you know, spread the idea that sharing is caring. And that, um, you know, and if you find out all of these different stories, and I mean, James is a therapist, and, you know, at heart, I'm somebody also who's sort of like very curious about the way in which other people live. Um, you know, I'm far more interested in other people's lives than my own because everybody else's life is far more interesting than mine anyway. But the point but is that the, it's what that, brought that us together, I, that curiosity. Yeah. And so the idea that, you know, you can use the medium of film right a to record different stories and then effectively to to share them again and again and again um, um and we know that although you know the stories told in these films are pretty truncated they're they they are you know they're never the full story they are just a sense if you like of what has happened in somebody's life but that in itself it be becomes a a, a sort of springboard, if you like, for for other people to, you know, reflect on, you know, some of the issues that people are talking about and how that has impacted on their grief. I suppose. Um, and, just... it, and again, that one is going to open up them, you know, to be able to talk more confidently about what they're going through. Well, reducing it down, of course, was the challenge. And I mean, one person we interviewed in our road trip across America was Scarlett Lewis, whose little boy was killed at Sandy Hook, one of the many children. Um, and that is a huge story. And we didn't actually feature it in the finished film because we felt that we wanted ordinary stories of ordinary people. And that was an, they were all extraordinary stories. But it still is on our Good Grief Project website because what we learned from Scarlett is that forgiving is not forgetting. And she had to forgive the shooter who shot all these six-year-old children. Um, 
and she had to carry on living. And so that's where we started our road trip across America. And that's a key component of that film in a way, in my mind. But but that's mm. what we've done, Julian. I suppose mm. throughout our our lives together, we've always made films about difficult subjects. Uh, we've made a film about my father who had dementia and died in a psychiatric hospital, which was supposed to be a dementia home. Um, and the only place we were allowed to film with him was in his bedroom. So we filmed with him for a year. Um, and we made a film called Jerry's Legacy, which is now used by Alzheimer's Society to, to encourage person-centered care. We didn't know what else to do. So in our helplessness, no, and Jimmy, of course, is a film editor, and it's such a great partnership because together we can manage to do these impossible things. But in the face of that helplessness, it's like, what can I do to help my dad? I can't get him out of there. No home will have him. We need to make a film that will encourage people to approach dementia in a different way. And similarly with our latest documentary, which is called Beyond the Mask which is about, you know, it's made entirely during COVID, the lockdown um, from March till March this year, um, interviewing people about what lockdown and COVID has meant to them. It's not about people dying with COVID. It's about people's grief during this time of COVID and what it has allowed or not allowed them to experience. So once again, it's about bearing witness to the undeniably difficult times that nearly everyone has had because everyone has been grieving for something and I don't think we're into a pecking order of pain yes it's terrible to lose a child but everyone has been grieving for something and I think Beyond the Mask possibly hopefully captures a bit of that and how people have made use of that to find their way through this very difficult time in history it's a kind of it's a kind of capturing of a year in history like no other that we've experienced. I guess uh, uh, this is a, um, a a moment where I want to bring up the a quote from a fantastic book called "The Body Keeps a Score" by Bessel van der Kolk, and he says social support is not the same as merely being in the presence of others. The critical issue is reciprocity, being truly heard and seen by the people around us, feeling that we are held in someone's mind and heart. For our physiology to calm down, heal and grow, we need a visceral feeling of safety. No doctor can write a prescription for friendship and love. These are complex and hard-earned capacities. And I, I, I think that that's a, um, that in a way that your the films are signposts for people to recognise that their experiences are valid that they're common, then that there are others who share them, that people are not alone. You know, this, this I, I guess this thing about peer-to-peer -peer in a sense is a, a, an aspect of community. You know, in a way we should, all our communities should be like this. We've lost this somehow. And somehow it's about trying to find our way back. Mm. I, so, uh, yeah. yeah, go on, Jimmy. I'm, I mean, I've got, you know, two sides of a filmmaking practice one as a professional film editor that you know has made you know i don't know over a hundred titles for for um you know for, for broadcasts there's somebody else's films then we have you know, the films that that, that um, you know that we've made together and as a as an independent filmmaker, I don't think that I could ever make a film that was beyond my own experience. That, you know, what's key to the work that we do is that we've shared that experience and that the people that we talk to have, you know, know that we come from a very similar place to them. And I think that's what I think that was something about what that quote was saying that you just read out. Mm. That reciprocity that enables us to be able to you know to um feel safe to, yeah to feel safe enough to make those films for our for our contributors to feel safe enough to 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 speak to us on camera um and it's a it's a very rewarding task to tell you the truth i mean it's very nice we i don't think that we set out these ways i don't set out 
with a specific end in mind um, when we have a project on the go to make a film. Um, and, and I think that's a good place to be, not to know where, the, where, where, where it's going because, you know, it will find its, its own way if you uh, 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 allow it to. So um, although you're more keen on the idea that films have got, you know, specific messages and, yeah. and that, you know, there's, and they've got specific purposes, um, it's very I think I'm much more interested in, in sort of like being in the moment as we film and finding, you know, and not being too prescriptive about where, where it's supposed to end up um, and then finding I mean. another moment mm. in the edit, and that again is truly that is another one that's really quite exciting, because you see your material again in a different light um, to where it was when you were when you were filming it, and so it can take on a different direction, and that's when you start to mould the film and start making it to produce that thing that yeah. you thought was there in the first place, but no, actually it never was. <laughs> I think it's fascinating because we're so different yet, but we're so similar, and that's what it's about. You know, if we can recognise that difference, something will come out of it. And we're not battling against it. It's not conflict between us. But there is something about that idea. I mean, I suppose what motivates me to do this, and it's not easy what we do. It's really not. And there's times I wish we'd never, I'd never begun to do it because I just want to disappear into into the ether, and I don't want anyone to know my story. But we're too far into it now. And I think that what keeps me going and what stops me running away is this idea that making films allows people to walk in the shoes of others, regardless of how difficult that experience is. And it, it does take courage and it's not easy. And I, I think that the body keeps the scorebook and the quote that you read out captures that amazingly. Um, and and I want people to, to do it. I think, you know... When you watch someone like Ken Loach's films, you think, thank God for people like him. Thank goodness. What a legend. What a, what a hero. You know, he can get right inside what matters. And everyone can sit in that room. Unfortunately, it's the people who don't need to learn these lessons that go to see his films. But we wish in an ideal world, every I wish that everyone would go and see his films. Um, this is like um, my my sister, who's been on the podcast, was a producer of Once Upon a Time in Iraq, um. and uh, and and you know we often consider, you know, has Tony Blair watched this film, watched this document? Has George Bush watched this documentary series? Because the 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 one of the huge problems we face is that the decision makers seem to have uh, lost that sense of compassion and social responsibility which then means that they can be incredibly cruel and not take responsibility for their actions. And, I, you know, how do you reach across that divide to say, what are you doing to the world? You know, what's... Uh... I don't know. And well, I wish Ken you would the say answer. that you, making the films is, is um, only a very small part of social change, if at all. And the point is that you can make a film, but without the structures that then enable you to, you know, embody those ideas in some kind of political project is, is that's another story altogether because really people will watch a film and then it will disappear into their, into the, into, into the, I don't know, the, the morass well, of I, their memories. Mark, I can't remember who Mark Como quotes, but he says uh, cinema is a machine for empathy. And, and I think something that sensitizes us and allows us a view into other people's happiness and suffering mm. is, is really important. Mm. But this brings us on to uh, actually talking about Beyond the Mask because we're uh, having an evening on October the 12th where some of the people in the film, including Catherine Mannix and uh, Lucy Selman and yourselves, obviously, and we're going to be joined by Amber Jeffrey, who uh, uh, runs the Grief Gang uh, podcast, who's who's also been on our podcast. Uh, we're going to have an evening uh, between seven and nine, and we're going to show Beyond the Mask, and we're going to have a discussion about uh, uh, community sources of uh, bereavement support. 
Um, I, I think that for me, you know, that what we spoke about right at the very beginning, um, which is was about saying the main the main source of support is that everyone needs is contained in community. And that's not something that just happens by itself because communities can be incredibly lonely places. But actually, it's about what we do with those communities and how we actually embolden and enhance and, and uh, somehow make it more available. And, and I think the work that you do does all of that. And so I think that you know one of the one of the ongoing themes that we've been talking about are community sources of bereavement support, and there's masses of stuff out there. We had Ben and Jack from the New Normal, you know. We've we've uh, Lucy runs a Good Grief Festival, uh, which which you know about, um, which is I don't know how many hundreds of individual organisations out there, small charities, people coming together doing something in the context of community sources of, mm-hmm. of grief support peer-to-peer support and and um, and so we're gonna we're gonna sell tickets for a small price and um, uh, and hopefully you know we'll have uh, many many people who will be able to join in the conversation see the film um, and uh, participate in the in the whole process so We've covered a lot of ground, and I'm sure there are big things that we've missed. But are there other things that you would like to talk about? Anything that's pressing that we should mention? What comes to mind? No, I don't know. I've just been struck by some of your comments, and it's been really nice to, to, to you know, to have um, the work that we do validated in the way that you have done that's mm. that's 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 really nice uh, well uh, I, it's the other way around for me actually uh, because um because obviously i come from a professional background and and um and can see the benefit of how professional stuff can help but i think it's it's wildly out of context and the, all the things that you've been doing give give that professionalism a context, and it's a a small part of something which is much much bigger, which is around community and and so there's a key bit about the renegotiation of relationships between professionals and community, and and a sense that actually the really important thing to get right you know is is the community base for support um rather than the professional one because the community base is how we can support everyone when no one feels left out the professional support is for a small minority of 5% of people perhaps who are severely affected by grief so it's much more important that even those 5% 100% of people need support, the love, laughter and friendship of the people around them. So let's concentrate on that rather than saying actually what the professionals do is most important. And I think you carry a really strong message about all of that. Well, that's very generous of you. And I think that, um, you know, as a psychotherapist, I think that it's not my psychotherapy hat that I wear on a grief retreat. It's my experience as a person as someone who's lost a child as someone who's learned so much from what Josh has taught me from being a parent from what I've learned from people who can't be parents you know I mean there's there's so much learning to be done and I think that it's very easy to hide behind a professional identity and that wouldn't be right Mm. you know if I was to do Mm. that on a grief retreat it wouldn't be Mm. the same experience Mm. um everyone who Mm guides people on our retreats is a professional but they're there as bereaved individuals who have so much respect and curiosity about other people's stories and lives Mm. and and that's what Mm. fuels us that's what fires us and that's why we do everything we do it's curiosity and I suppose respect for just how people find their way through (laughs) 
Well, uh, uh, it's great, and um, and hopefully it's all part of a bigger picture of bringing this stuff to light. So the more people that can hear about it, the better. And uh, so many of the themes that you talk about are, you know, we've we've had two podcasts specifically about um, community sources, bereavement sport with Amber Jeffrey and and uh, Ben and Jack from the New Normal. And uh, and I love it that, that these are young people talking about their grief, mm. and they're they're so wise with it. It's mm. absolutely great, yeah. and, and echo many of the messages that you say. So the more we can talk about it, the better. Yes, absolutely. Yes. And and our young folk need that that platform. They do, and certainly bereaved siblings are often the forgotten mourners, and their 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 voices need to be heard loud and clear. I uh, I. Uh, uh, Totally, and um, and and I, you know, I what you say about being a mother, you know, again, or or being a parent is. Uh, I mean, I'm just finishing another lovely book called Braiding Sweetgrass, which um, um, which is about uh, um, Robin Wall Kimmerer is a, a professor of biology, but that's the last thing she does because the first thing she does is that she's a mother. Mm. And the second thing is that she's from a first from a um, Native American community, and so she has this fan- incredible sense of uh, connectedness and interdependence. But she says that being a mother was always the most important thing for her, and 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 we learn so much from bringing out children. <laughs> it's, mm. it's the wrong way around again. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I have three questions uh, for at the end that I ask all my guests, and I'm going to ask you each in turn. And uh, Jane, you can start. Tell me about a moment when the smallest thing made the biggest difference. Gosh, I wouldn't have minded having a bit of time to prepare for this, but we're just going to go <laughs> for it. The smallest thing that made the biggest difference was actually two years after Josh died. I went on a grief retreat. I was desperate. I was lonely. I was going out of my mind, really. I just couldn't figure out what was going on. And I arrived at this retreat and somebody met me at the door and she said to me, and who are you here to remember? And I said, Joshua. And for me, that was a bit of a turning point because, you know, we'd made films about Say Their Name. We'd made, nobody was asking me anything. That's (laughs) straightforward and simple. So that moved me, and it taught me so much. That's lovely. How about you, Jimmy? Well, I guess it's a similar sort of event, although in the reverse, it's the negative aspect of that. And I realised that when the first time somebody asked me how many children I had, and I said two. Oh, golly. Um, And at that point on, I realised that that was so wrong an answer but I just didn't want to go any further at that point and in that moment of my life I didn't want to go any further but the big difference is that I've learned from that and uh, I gained quite a lot of um, I don't know a bit more courage I guess Um, (laughs) um, you know for for for, you know from sharing that Um, I have to say that I've sort of swung to the other end of the pendulum in some instances and sort of blurted it out. Well, one of them's dead. And that was <laughs> <laughs> but, So that's, that's not really helpful either. But that's how to clear a room. <laughs> when you don't clear yeah. a room, it works. <laughs> I tell you what, you should try telling people you're a palliative care physician and then they tell you, yeah. oh, you must be so whatever and never talk to you again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, the second question is, what's your favourite public moment of compassion? Uh, and Jimmy, you can start this time. <laughs> well, I actually had thought I mean, um, a public moment. It's a public moment that's actually on screen. And I love the moments in Ken Loach's film, um, I, Daniel Blake, when he's at the end of the film and he's come outside of the, um, uh, uh, of the Social Security office and he's scribbled his name on the, on, on, on the wall and in, he just passes by in the street are applauding him. Um, and that, that sense that, you know, anonymous people 
are, are giving you that 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 kind of to sort of public support um, at the moment in which you know he's feeling totally desperate, so fucking angry, and you know everything else as that he's been trying to do has has failed. Um, yeah, so but um, mm. but that's a I guess a sort of dramatized event. Um, no, it's yeah. so a good example. And a dramatized events, it's another story. And stories, as we know, are really powerful ways of learning. So absolutely sits up there. How about you, Jane? Ask me the question. So what's your favourite public moment of compassion? Gosh, I think I must be getting tired now because I'm finding that quite difficult to answer. And, you know, I, I am finding that one difficult to answer because there's so many and I can't. It's almost like it's scrambled my brain a bit. I don't know if that's allowed to forego it. I mean, because Ken Loach has been mentioned, he's very much in the front of my mind, particularly because he's just been chucked out of the Labour Party. And I think that's appalling and disrespectful and beyond words. And I think of a scene in one of his films where he's going to a care home. This is not public, but it happens in the film, so it is public. And he's visiting someone, that the person in the film is visiting one of, actually, no, the woman who is visiting a client who she's supposed to be a carer for asks her to brush her hair and she knows she hasn't got time to do it because she has to be on to the next person in five minutes and she risks her job and forgive me if I've got this wrong but what stuck in my mind was she risked her job she took on ownership of that situation and she thought the hell with it this matters more and she sat and she brushed this person's hair and probably got the sack for it I don't know but it's a it's a dilemma that I think every professional faces, knowing that really the human side of them would like to spend more time with the person in front of them and the demands of the job don't allow that. And and there's an interesting discussion to be had, which we will do on the podcast at some point, about the traumatizing effect of working in health and social care. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's a... a that those those institutions are trauma inducing for the people who work in them yes. and and expecting people to be compassionate is a big ask in in those kind of circumstances so yeah i think you're exactly right to point that out and especially julian following the year we've just had right. especially and that's what especially. the world of ask is about you know what's really yeah. going on what's really going on here right. exactly okay the third question I have is, um, what does the good life mean to you? What matters most in your life? Well, open water at a temperature of 15 degrees <laughs> centigrade. Oh, wow. Oh, you'd, you'd, yeah, in a nice wetsuit. <laughs> Without a wetsuit. Naked. <laughs> totally skinny. Totally skinny. <laughs> How about you, Jane? Um, so the question is, sorry, ask me again. What does the good life mean to you? What? Well, yeah. the good life looks very different to me after Josh's death. You know, in a way, I didn't know what the good life was. I didn't really know what the bad life was until he died. Um, the good life is what Josh taught me in his 22 years is that oddly, every day counts so much and there's no guarantees in anything we do. And so... However low I feel, however much I miss him, however much I'm grieving, I remind myself that my Josh taught me in his 22 years that each day has to be seized and I've just got to get through it and do the best I can and I can't do better than that. It is um, it is what it is and it's crap a lot of the time, but there's still good stuff to be had. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, that's that's the perfect note to end on. And thank you both so much for taking the time to chat. And and I look forward a lot to seeing the film again and chatting some more on our evening in October. Thank you, Julian. And thank Thanks, you for sharing Julian. your wisdom it's as been, well. It's, it's been, been great. Lovely. It's been lovely. It's been well, lovely. thank you. It's been lovely to talk to you. Thank you well, for likewise. your teachings as well. And, and just to say, because even though it's via Zoom and our Beyond the Mask is made via Zoom, there is a lot of opportunity, even remotely, to connect and to have that kind of intimate connection. Um, Zoom doesn't need to, or, you know, it doesn't have to be distant. 
And I think that has been a discovery for a lot of people in this last year or two. We're thinking things very differently now about connection. And, and we'll put uh, in the show notes the details on your website, about your website and how to contact you. And, and for people who are interested in doing your retreats and seeing, seeing the other films that you've, that you've made, all the connections and contacts are there. So uh, it'll all be in the show notes. Thank you. Cool. Good. Thank you. All right. right.